Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today on transition services and activities for justice-involved youth and young adults with disabilities. My name is Abir Sichter, and I'm a senior policy analyst with the Council of State Governments, known as CSG for short. And my main role is working on our Cape Youth Project, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. For today's webinar, our speakers are gonna highlight ways that states are supporting transition outcomes for justice-involved youth with disabilities. We're gonna hear from a wonderful array of presenters from Oregon, California, South Carolina, along with Cornell University and the US Department of Labor. But before we get started, I'd like to draw your attention to a few housekeeping items. Next slide. Closed captioning is available and can be accessed through the link that we've shared in the chat. Furthermore, to reduce noise during the conversation, all participants will be uh, muted during the webinar. If you have any questions for our panelists, please submit them through the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window. And we're gonna have a Q&A session after all our speakers speak today uh, toward the end of the webinar. Furthermore, if you have any technical difficulties or a question about Zoom, you can also use the Q&A feature to type a question and CSG staff will get back to you as soon as possible. And feel free to use the general chat, uh, the general chat box, submit any general comments. It's also where we will be placing links to resources that we and guest speakers will mention. Lastly, today's slide deck, which includes links to various resources that will be mentioned and a recording of today's webinar will, will be made available in a few weeks. And everyone who's registered today will receive uh, that through a follow-up email uh, uh, soon. Without further delay, let's get started with our program. As I mentioned earlier, today's presentation is part of, is part of our CAPE Youth Project, which stands for the Center for Advancing Policy on Employment for Youth. The mission of CAPE Youth is to build the capacity of policymakers to support youth and young adults with disabilities in their transitions to adulthood and employment. And we do this by helping states build their capacity in their youth service delivery and their workforce systems. And Cape Youth does this, we pursue our mission in a number of ways. At Cape Youth, we conduct research on innovative policies and programmatic approaches to improve transition and employment related outcomes for youth and young adults with disabilities. We develop strategic partnerships between national, state, and local workforce systems. We share best practices among key stakeholders, including people with disabilities, their families, policymakers, practitioners, and more. And we help to identify uh, uh, opportunities to deepen their support of youth and young adults by expanding career pathways, work-based learning, offering professional development for providers, and more. Now, who helps run Cape Youth? Well, here at Cape Youth, we're funded by the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy, known as ODEP for short. And we're a collaboration between CSG, where I work, uh, between the Yang Tan Institute on Employment and Disability at Cornell University, and the Interwork Institute at San Diego State University. Now that you've got an overview of Cape Youth, let's start with our main programming. It's my honor to introduce our first guest speaker and my co-author for Cape Youth's upcoming uh, briefs on justice-involved youth, Matt Sala. Matt Sala serves in two main roles at Cornell University. He is a senior research associate at the Yang Tan Institute on Employment and Disability, and he's also uh, became earlier this year Cornell, uh, the director of research, excuse me, director of research at Cornell University's Criminal Justice and Employment Initiative. Matt also teaches courses in disability studies and mass incarceration. He's a faculty advisor for Cornell's Undergraduate Mock Trial Association, a 2021 recipient of their Engaged Learning Teaching Award, and he was a 2015 Fulbright Scholar in Barbados. Matt earned a PhD and master's from Columbia University, a law degree from Syracuse University, and his bachelor's from Union College. Matt, the floor is yours, and thank you for joining us. Great, thanks, Abir. Um, yeah, and so my role here is going to be to provide a little bit of context that our later speakers are going to really um, fill in a lot of the great detail and nuance to. Um, so to kind of uh, give us a framework for thinking about what we're talking about today, I want us to first take a step back and think about um, across all the different roles that that people can can um, work within that where they're where they're serving justice involved young people with disabilities. Um, I think first we need to kind of like. Take, take a step back and, and think about what do we mean by justice involvement? And in, this is particularly important when you're talking about um, youth and young adults who are involved in the justice system, because it can mean a lot of different things. Um, so the reason that I, I think this is important is because community partnerships um, for youth 
th that are involved in the justice system can vary quite a bit based on whether they're, for instance, um, located in the community, whether they're in an out of community placement. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of those differences. Um, many of us are probably aware of the different things that justice, justice involvement can mean for youth and young adults, but um, it's kind of crucial to, to situate our conversation within that. Um, so I'm going to ask you all kind of a, a rhetorical question, meaning that I, I, I'm not going to wait for answers, but I think you could put answers in the chat and maybe we can return to them um, uh, as we're talking later. But I wanted to, say, to ask um, what kind of settings come to mind for everybody in the room when they think of the term justice involvement for youth and young adults and also for youth and young adults with disabilities. Um, so feel free to put your thoughts in the chat and we'll go to the next slide, please, Mary. Right, so um, I think part of the reason this is important um, to think through as a framework is that, uh, especially in comparison to uh, justice-involved adults who are in the adult correctional um, system, for youth, particularly as juvenile justice reform is spreading around the country, um, it can mean quite a few different things. Some examples are um, an actual placement in a detention center that's becoming less common um, year over year than it was, for instance, um, in the in you know around 2010 2014 when when um, some of these rates of of out of community placement really um, reached their peak in the United States, um, it can also mean things like location in shelters, um, group homes, youth camps, pre adjudicated services, and things like diversion programs where the young person is intentionally diverted away from a formal um, um, uh, uh, adjudication of of some sort, right? So. And th the reason that we think this is really crucial to think about is you don't want to paint with a broad brush when thinking about what it means for a young person to be uh, justice involved. And um, the, the roles of community partners can vary substantially. If, for instance, if in a detention placement, I mean, in a, in a diversion program, a, a community service providers will be often be heavily involved, right? Um, whether it's um, through some kind of counseling services, whether it's employment-based services, things like that. So it's just really crucial to think of things with a slightly broader um, lens. Um, next slide, please, Mary. And it can be particularly important when you're talking about justice-involved youth and young adults with disabilities. In part, that's because these youth are, are on average much more likely to be multiple systems involved. And what we mean by that is that they aren't just, invo just involved in the justice system at one time, right? A simple example of this would be a young person who's involved both in a, a local education um, setting and in the justice system simultaneously. That's obviously quite common. Um, but for young adults with, this, with disabilities, this could mean a, a host of other things. It could mean involvement in the child welfare system. There's a huge amount of overlap between juvenile justice involvement and involvement in foster care and child welfare services um, in, in pretty much every state in the United States. It can also mean things like youth, it can be something where a youth with disability is transitioning, for instance, but fr from uh, between systems like uh, juvenile justice and developmental disability agencies, mental health um, agencies, and, and ultimately uh, state vocational rehabilitation as well. So um, in a separate area of work that we're doing for Cape Youth, um, and this is also something that I focus on in my own um, work and, and, a, and a couple other grant, grants that I have, um, is the the need for more collaboration, for instance, between workforce systems, vocational rehabilitation systems, and juvenile justice agencies, where because of their different policy objectives, there tends to um, not be the highest levels of collaboration between some of these agencies. So that's kind of a broader consideration. Um, and beyond just the potential, the higher likelihood of being multiple systems involved for youth and young adults with disabilities, there's also unique challenges that youth with disabilities and young adults with disabilities face when they're involved in the justice system. Um, there's higher rates of recidivism across a number of studies, um, more difficulty transitioning to work and um, second post-secondary education, transitioning back to their prior school environment, um, and lifetime things like lifetime earnings and lifetime um, financial security are all of these outcomes tend to be lower for youth with, with disabilities. Um, next slide, please, Mary. And um, then another thing that I think, again, many of us in the room might be aware of this, but I think it's always important to call attention to this. When thinking in um, with an intersectional lens, it's also it, uh, really demands um, a mention that youth with disabilities are dramatically overrepresented in juvenile justice contexts. And when you're thinking of young adults who are maybe transitioning into adulthood, there's also higher, higher rates of disability in the adult correction system in the United States as well. Um, one thing here is, so, so uh, 
these things are also quite difficult to estimate at a given time, and this will become relevant again when we return to some of our um, conversations about strategies for identifying youth when they with, with, um, as having a disability when they enter um, the justice system. Um, the, because these things are hard to estimate, especially at a national level, the estimates are really broad, right? So this is from um, the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitation Services in this um, statistic on the left here of the screen, or I think it's y'all's left, um, uh, that somewhere between 30 and 60% of youth placed in juvenile detention facilities have some type of disability. Often um, this, this, there's higher representatives of uh, representations of cognitive disabilities, um, uh, intellectual developmental disabilities, mental health um, conditions, uh, all tend to be higher. One of the problems is we don't know exactly what the rate of overrepresentation is, in part because in, in many contexts we don't know, right? There's not, um, there isn't great measurement, there aren't way, great ways to capture the exact um, rate of disability, especially when you're talking about invisible disabilities and things like that. Um, so I kind of spoiled the question that I was going to ask, but again, I think we're kind of um, it, it, I'd love if people have contributions in the chat to some of these things, but um, I think it's always as we move into some of the strategies and and um, and public policy solutions and 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 solutions on the ground, it's good to think about why might we see such variation in a statistic like this, um, and also depending what state you're in or um, if you if you come from a state policy context. Um, it's it's often really important to know what are the statistics in your state, right? Um, for instance, uh, it, it, in New York, we're just now starting to um, get, which is the state I reside in, we're still just starting now to get our our um, our head around just what the overrepresentation of youth with disabilities is in the juvenile justice system in New York, and this is overlapping with pretty dramatic policy level changes in how the um, juvenile justice system operates in the state as well. So so thinking in terms of um, this, the, these issues with proportionality is, it can be really important at a state and local level as well. Next slide, please. And um, so we wanted to provide, so it, just in the spirit of, of continuing to develop a kind of framework for thinking about what we're gonna talk about with our um, presenters who have, who have um, local kind of um, uh, strategies that they're gonna present on. We also, you also wanna think about around like where, where might a youth be across the spectrum of of justice involvement, right? Are they just entering the system? Are they currently in a residential placement? Are they are they re-entering their community? Are they in aftercare to as a means to help them um, obtain kind of like positive community indicators, um, things that are helpful in, in avoiding recidivism? Um, and another reason this is important is because that will that will change the kinds of services that are that might be necessary, that what it might mean to do wraparound services or holistic care. So um, situating the youth where they actually are in these experiences of justice involvement can be highly important. Next slide, please. And Erin, in, in, in Abir, I'll, I'll ask you if I'm, a, if I'm a, taking too much time, please stop me. I wanna make sure we do have enough time for our um, other speakers. Um, so quickly, I'm gonna give us an intro, I'm gonna give you all an introduction to the two briefs that we've been developing at Cape Youth um, and some of the policy considerations that come out of them. And then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of, uh, I'll, I'll leave some of it for what the actual reports say, but we wanted to kind of give an introduction because it really does help to frame what our, our other um, speakers are going to uh, talk about today. Next slide, please. So um, a lot of the work that we've done in this area is based on a roundtable discussion that was held in November 15th of 2021 um, in collaboration with the White House Office of Public Engagement. Uh, the purpose was to understand policy implications and lived experiences of justice-involved youth, um, including youth in, at the table is, is a big um, emphasis of the Cape Youth Project more generally. Um, and um, take into account the, the intersectional experience that uniquely impacts access to employment and education and other um, uh, kind of positive community-based indicators. The reason here is um, one of the important things about focusing not just on recidivism, is that recidivism is ultimately a negative outcome that we do want to avoid in a public policy sense, but there's a high level of correlation between accessing um, um, community-based services, accessing um, educational opportunities, accessing work in a livable wage, and reduce recidivism. So it's a complicated kind of statistical relationship between those two things, but it's known that those, those correlations exist, so it's important to keep them in mind. Um, and the two policy briefs, which we're going to go into in a second, um, were based on the findings from this roundtable discussions. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the purpose of the research, and I think this is really a lot of the added value of these um, 
um, research briefs is that they don't only kind of summarize some of the best pro practices, promising practices that exist for this for this population, but also um, we pulled together some state and local examples, and we're going to actually hear directly from um, um, partners who who are implementing these things on the ground. But we wanted to really um, buttress what we talked about in terms of the research, in terms of um, findings on promising practices and best practices, with real kind of um, tangible examples of what these uh, what these um, uh, uh, holistic service provision approaches look like, coordinated care, um, things that take that research and really put it into practice. So I think that's going to be a major topic of the um, conversation today. And also not thinking um, and looking past just short-term outcomes, right? Like looking, looking past um, what tend to be common statistics around, did the person recidivate within six months, within a year, right? Looking really beyond that and thinking about the person's life course in a humanizing way that looks at their their outcomes beyond just the point of whether they um, whether they did recidivate. Um, so the two um, brief topics are uh, rehabilitation and recovery practices. The second one is educational and economic access. Next slide, please. Um, so, uh, and I think again, this is something that we might all be be broadly familiar with, but the 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 um, American criminal justice system in general, and specifically, uh, this is more true even with juvenile justice policy, it really is changing um, at, in this current moment with an emphasis on, on rehabilitation and recovery, particularly for young people who are involved in the justice system. And in part, that, that new policy focus that, that is existing at the federal level and at state and local levels is driven by an, a, a, a deepening understanding of the intersectional considerations the ways that um, multiply disadvantaged youth are more likely to end up overrepresented in the justice system. And a challenge that comes with this though, is that these systems are, I think that the there's about 40,000, I believe, uh, or, or sorry, 14,000 um, justice agencies in the United States, right? And it's not all operated centrally. So a lot of these efforts are really being driven in a good way by local actors, by state actors, um, and because of that, it's on the one hand, there's challenges in terms of summarizing, um, you know, what are best practices, what do promising practices look like on the ground, but also there's it, it highlights the importance of of bringing in those um, examples, right, and case studies from from these uh, uh, local contexts. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, and so these are some of the core considerations. Again, I'm, I'm summarizing at a very high level. The, the brief itself goes into much greater detail on these things. Um, but some of the core things that came out of our research for this brief include things like expanding initial screening to identify and address individualized needs, right? This goes back to that um, question from before that we kind of posed uh, rhetorically around like, why would there be such a broad estimate from 30 to 60% of the rate of disability within juvenile justice settings? Part of that is, is, although screening of some sort exists at most local levels, it, it varies quite a bit. And um, the, the, the role of initial screening, not just to know that a disability might exist, but also to, to be able to provide individualized services is really, really important. And again, that's where um, um, it's kind of can be tough to compare apples and oranges across all these different contexts, but it also is crucial to do so. Um, uh, uh, something that is, again, this is kind of happening already at many state and local levels, but replacing punitive isolation practices with recovery practices. And again, this is moving away from that framework of, of, um, of, of punishment and more towards rehabilitation and recovery. Um, developing culturally competent training uh, to address intersectionality issues. Again, disability is not the only intersectional consideration. Um, race is frequently mentioned in conversations about the American criminal justice system. But um, the one thing that's, that really does come out in the research is that frontline practitioners who are often the ones um, directly working with youth, particularly in justice systems, they, they, they might not receive specialized training on how to work with not just disability, uh, youth with disabilities and you know, young adults with disabilities generally, but, but with specific types of disability, right? And, and some of that is about collaboration and communication between education providers and um, juvenile justice um, staff. Um, it's about bringing in other types of collaboration with, for instance, mental health agencies, developmental disabilities agencies, uh, VR and workforce, um, who are more um, tasked with working with youth um, uh, um, to provide them, for instance, employment and education services in the community. 
And then lastly, for this um, topic, um, we focused on implementing trauma-informed practices to address unresolved needs. Next slide, please. Um, so quickly, I'm also going to give a brief high-level overview of the educational and economic access brief that we did, and then I'm going to hand it back to Abir to introduce our next speaker. Um, but uh, I think uh, the kind of in a, at a baseline um, sense, it's it's very well known that youth and young adults with disabilities who are who are justice involved are less likely to access higher education and employment services. Um, they're less likely to enter the workforce generally, um, and this is these are long-term. Um, uh, challenges, and they often end up in lower paying and short term positions, even when they are um, employed shortly after right so the sustainability of the type of work that they end up that a person ends up getting can can also have kind of long term ripple effects. Um, uh, and at the same time, again, I, I want to be careful not to make too many uh, broad causal statements because the, the, the relationship between education employment and recidivism is a very complicated relationship. That being said, there is a well-established correlation between um, youth who quickly connect with higher education and employment opportunities um, after, after being involved in the justice system. There's a high correlation between that and successful transition back to the community, um, increased likelihood of, of sustainable wages, which again is, is a kind of also a predictor of, of um, uh, community uh, uh, reintegration and 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 um, decreased likelihood of of recidivism, um, and ultimately kind of balancing like why all of these things are important in a holistic picture, not just thinking about recidivism, but also thinking about employment and education. Next slide, please. And so these were some of the core considerations um, that came out of uh, this brief as well. Um, so increasing access and connecting students to higher education opportunities. Again, this is um, across the literature one of the one of the most solidly um, uh, demonstrated uh, um, predictors of, of future access to employment and education. Um, but that, again, it'll, the way it will look and how those, those conduits to higher education um, access um, exposure, how that will happen is, is much different, right? And we're gonna have some examples of, of today of, of collaborations between corrections departments and um, higher education institutions, community colleges, things like that. So um, both understanding how those look at local and state levels, but also what, what kind of emerging practices bubble to the surface from those uh, different examples is really important. Um, incentiv incentivizing participation in training programs and work opportunities was another consideration, and then removing barriers to employment by limiting exclusionary policies. And that's that can sound very broad and, and what an exclusionary policy might look like. Um, can take a lot of different forms, but um, again, the this can this can be everything from uh, kind of de jour legal restrictions on accessing certain types of work, which exist in every state in the United States and, and every territory in the United States, um, to other things like the role of background checks in private discrimination by employers and things like that. So um, these are things that really do exist at the level of policy. Even even how policy can affect private discrimination is a big consideration, specifically around educational access and employment access. Next slide, please. And so uh, again, these are just the full titles of the two briefs. Um, they're going to be made available, uh, Abir can probably tell us, um, um, relatively soon, I, I believe. So um, with that, I'm going to hand back to Abir, who I think is going to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Abir, I think you're muted. Thank you, Matt. Sorry about that, everyone. I was just saying thanks, Matt, for highlighting Cape Youth's work and for setting up our uh, guest speakers today. As Matt mentioned, Cape Youth has two policy briefs that will be published soon, and we'll make sure to send those out in follow-up communications to everyone. Uh, the first one should be published in the next week or so, so you'll get that soon. And we linked in the chat to our policy briefs, which includes one short brief we have our, out already on Justice Involved Youth. Uh, with that, let me introduce our next speaker, Dr. Brian Hartman. Brian Hartman earned his doctorate from the Illinois School of Professional Psychology in 2005. His clinical training involved deaf specialty programs in Chicago, and he was the first intern in the Deaf Link program at the University of Colorado's Health Sciences Center. Furthermore, doc, uh, Dr. Hartman previously worked for 13 years as a psychologist at Oregon State Hospital while maintaining a private practice. He has published seminal research into seclusion and restraint rates for hard of hearing individuals in psychiatric settings. And in 2021, he became the supervising psychologist for the Oregon Youth Authority. Dr. Hartman, thank you for joining us and the floor is yours. 
Thank you and good day everyone. Um, next slide please. Uh, Mary, can you? Thank you. So really briefly, just want to mention Oregon Youth Authority is the state level uh, correctional system for Oregon and includes nine close custody facilities as well as community supervision. In Oregon, we are lucky enough to have a fairly robust system within our facilities uh, related to mental health, which of course begins with obtaining intake and assessment information. Next slide, please. So within OIA facilities, we have a wide variety of providers, which includes psychologists, psychiatrists, psychiatric mental health nurse practitioners, which for that section, I'll just refer to it as psychiatry from here on throughout the presentation. We have approximately 35 qualified mental health professional positions, as well as certified alcohol and drug counselors, which recently started to include youth interns as well. So youth who have gone on to um, achieve their intern status as CADCs. They do not provide services to other youth, but they are able to complete their certifications here. Um, Within the range of QMHP staff that we have, that includes both licensed and unlicensed practitioners, most of whom are at the master's level. We have one psychologist, one licensed psychologist also, that is a uh, QMHP at one of our facilities. So it is a wide range of providers, which creates a robust opportunity for interaction with youth and ability to uh, support use from varying perspectives. Next slide, please. So we conduct mental health assessments at multiple points. First off is anytime somebody comes into close custody for the first time, when there are facility transfers, as well as uh, as needed by referral. Also, uh, if somebody comes back on a revocation. They will also have a mental health assessment of some ilk. Next slide, please. So we have our initial intake assessment, which is completed by one of the QMHPs. Within one hour of arriving at a facility, each youth is seen by a QMHP for an intake for an initial intake assessment. This applies to both uh, initial intakes as well as when somebody comes back on a parole violation. Uh, revocation, then they will also have a uh, initial intake completed by a QMHP. That initial intake assessment consists of a brief clinical interview, the MAZI-2, a suicide risk assessment, which at this point we are currently using the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale lifetime recent version upon intake, um, and then completing a formulation at the end of that as well as sexual victimization risk assessment, which is a requirement of from the Prison Rape Elimination Act, also known as PREA. If a youth is prescribed psychotropic medications, and we know that at the time of intake, the intake QMHP refers them for a psychiatric intake, and psychiatric providers will continue those medications initially until they can see the youth uh, themselves and make their own impressions and diagnostic uh, formulation. Next slide, please. Also, somewhat unique to Oregon, as far as I understand it, is that statutorily, we are required to complete an intake psychological assessment on every youth on their initial admission into close custody. Uh, there's one exception built into that, and that is if a psychological evaluation has been completed within the last six months, then we do not have to do that. In that case, what we do is we just, re one of the psychologists will review that report, typically meet briefly with the youth and then uh, determine from that whether we need to actually do a full intake or whether we want to uh, just utilize that. And typically those, uh, those assessments are a little bit more in depth than what we are able to do at intake and so uh, it is typical that we go with what we have uh, from the recent evaluation. Our goal for those intake psychological assessments is for these to be seen within 30 days of, mission, of admission unless clinically indicated otherwise. Uh, when I started, we were very, when I started two years ago, we were very behind. We made some small tweaks to things and we've actually all, had almost 100% uh, achievement of that goal within the last two years. 
the one time, a couple of times we have not have been times where either a youth was paroled out before we could actually see them. So they were paroled within a, le within a month. Or in some cases we have youth who uh, for various reasons are not amenable or it would not be a uh, good practice to conduct that assessment immediately within that window. And at that time we can then uh, go forward with uh, with seeing them once we have a chance to sort of build a little bit of a rapport with them and get them to be a little bit more co cooperative and collaborative with us. So our assessment, our intake assessment involves a clinical interview as well as review of any available records, the age appropriate Achenbach assessments, also called the ACEBA. Um, some people know of them as child behavior checklist, youth self-report, um, adult self-report. There's you know, depends on the age as to what exactly it's called, but child behavior checklist is probably the best known of that. Uh, and so the youth does their version of, or completes the self-report version of that. We also uh, continue to utilize the suicide probability scale. Uh, that was That has been a long-term uh, tool. We are beginning now, though, to start looking to see if there's other uh, better tools because we have found a few issues with those, and so we're trying to see if we can come up with a better tool to use. Then the uh, psychologist that is doing the assessment completes uh, their diagnostic impressions and makes recommendations for placement, programming, as well as mitigation of violence and self-harm risk. So we have several, like I said, we have nine facilities. Of those, uh, three are transitional camps, so those would not be part of the recommendations after initial intake, but the other six facilities would be recommend, there would be recommendations about those as well as towards what we call the courtyard units at our main facility, which are some specialized units with extra staffing, with uh, staff who have extra training, a little bit more QMHP support for youth with mental health issues, uh, reactive attachment issues, and those sorts of things. And so the psychologists make recommendations about that as well. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, we also have psychiatry services that uh, can have multiple, multiple paths to, uh, to those referrals. First off, as mentioned, the intake QMHP, if the youth report's currently being prescribed psychotropic medications and we have the verification of that, or if the QMHP sees indications of an urgent need for medication evaluation, they can put in a referral to the clinic to be to have the youth be seen uh, by psychiatry. Uh, additionally, within within that same hour is uh, of intake, a nurse sees a youth, and so if that intake nurse assessment uh, sees you know comes up with something that suggests that there is. Uh, current psychotropic medication prescription or that there is a need for uh, to see a psychiatrist, the nurse can also put in that uh, referral. We Within, I believe it is a week of intake, there is a full uh, medical evaluation with a physician and that provider can also do a referral for psychiatry as well as the psychologist completing the intake psychological assessment. So as you can see, we have multiple paths where if we see mental health issues that uh, would appear to need medication or if there is a standing history of psychotropic medication, we ensure that it gets in there. And then last but not least, the unit team, including the unit QMHP, can also make a referral for psychiatric services. Next slide, please. All right. We also screen all youth for substance use disorders. And if screening suggests further assessment is needed, a full standardized assessment is completed by our substance use providers. Based on the results of screening assessment, the substance use disorder diagnosis and the ACM level of care are determined. And then treatment goals are determined in collaboration with the youth and treatment is initiated at, their, at the facility at which they are ultimately placed. Next slide, please. So back to a beer. Thank you so much, Dr. Hartman, for your presentation and for highlighting the importance of the intake process in the juvenile justice system. Uh, now I will introduce our two, our next two speakers together who are coming to us from the Youth Law Center. 
First, we have Katie Bliss, who's a senior advocate overseeing the California Higher Education Project at the Youth Law Center. She is also the founder of Project Change at the San Mateo County Community College District. And Project Change is a state model program and the first comprehensive community college funded program in California that provides in-person college instruction inside juvenile facilities. Katie earned a master's and bachelor's degree from Notre Dame de Namur University, as well as a bachelor's from San Francisco State University. Having dropped out of high school and been incarcerated during her adolescence, Katie's drive to create educational pathways for justice impacted youth comes from both personal and professional experience. And we also have Jasmine Ying Miller. Jasmine Ying Miller is a staff attorney at the Youth Law Center and works out of Nashville, Tennessee. Her work focuses on the intersection between juvenile justice, child welfare, and education systems, including in particular uh, special education and, the transi and transitions to post-secondary education. Before becoming a lawyer, she was a college counselor for Metro Nashville Public Schools, where she primarily worked with immigrant and refugee students, first-generation students, and undocumented youth as well. Jasmine earned both her law degree and her master's in education from Stanford University and her bachelor's from Harvard University. Jasmine and Katie, thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thanks so much. Great to have everyone here today. We're very excited to be here to share with you about the exciting work that's happening to create opportunities for young people impacted by the juvenile justice system to access higher education pathways and to build their futures. Next slide. So to ground us in where our work for Pathways to Higher Education is based, we wanted to share a bit about where we work, which is Youth Law Center, uh, which is a national nonprofit law firm that advocates to transform foster care and youth justice systems so that every child and youth can thrive. We use a variety of strategies, uh, including legislative and policy advocacy, litigation, as well as providing a great deal of technical assistance through our pathways work and beyond to unify key stakeholders and partners to build community and to create collective opportunities for our youth to have access to and succeed in college. I do just wanna take a moment um, because pictured here um, on our slide is Jackie, who is one of our student alumni from college programming um, that we're gonna share a little bit about later. And um, this is offered to youth impacted by the juvenile justice system. Um, Jackie's a rock star. I wish we could have had her um, today to share, um, but I'm just gonna shout her out. Um, Jackie was in juvenile hall when she was just 12 years old. And while she was there, she was connected to a program, um, Project Change. And while starting to take college classes when she was still in high school through the program, while she was at Juvenile Hall, um, once she was released, she came to community college where the program is based and then transferred to UCLA. She graduated um, and then recently came to work with us at Youth Law Center. And also she um, joined the Cape Youth Working Group. And just this month, she was accepted to Stanford Law School. Um, so it's very exciting um, and just wanted to share a little bit with her permission, of course, um, about her story, since this is an emphasis on what we want to share about folks um, who are really thriving. Um, next slide, please. So over the last several years at Youth Law Center, we've had the opportunity to bridge our legal decarceration and alternatives to incarceration advocacy with our pathways to higher education work. So now in California, there's over 85 community college programs that are dedicated to system impacted students, um, but 45 of which include a specific focus on system impacted youth. Um, as we will discuss later in this presentation, Youth Law Center in partnership with our California Community Colleges Rising Scholars Network has created this opportunity to implement strong college programs for justice impacted young people, both inside juvenile detention centers and on community college campuses. And this will continue to expand thanks to legislation, funding and a network of practitioners. And Youth Law Center's Pathways Project has resulted in state and federal advocacy to improve access to financial aid for system impacted youth, and has also helped bring together key partners to use their higher education work as an opportunity for positive system change. Ultimately, there's a significant movement of exciting change to view every young person as a college student, that post-secondary pathways should be available to all, and that an investment in a youth's future is an investment in the future of generations of people to come. So we're very excited about these groundbreaking and historic changes in the juvenile justice system in California to be a beacon for the country to illustrate what's possible. 
Next slide. So we wanna take a, a spotlight to the exciting movement to make higher education a priority that is happening in California as an example for what's possible. Um, and so thanks to the momentum and partnerships, the governor of California signed into legislation this nationally historic investment of 15 million annually to support the development and implementation of college programs for juvenile justice impacted youth. So this is the first time a state has dedicated this level of funding specifically to this population of students for higher education. It's very exciting. It's only the beginning. Um, and hopefully this is, you know, not something that's just here. This should be everywhere. So this funding supports up to 45 California community college programs, both on a college campus and in juvenile detention facilities. And inclusive of this model, which we're going to share more about later, um, our courses taught by professors from the college to come to detention facilities and offer classes both to students while they're still in high school um, and graduates for college credit through dual enrollment. Um, students are also provided comprehensive support to transition to their local college upon release to enroll and be supported on their campus, as well as have a structure that includes early release, step-down approaches, alternatives to incarceration. So students are offered the opportunity to enroll in college versus going into detention in the first place. And there's also significant community building with peer support. So students are able to build a network of other positive peers pursuing their goals through a program club activities and events for team building and leadership opportunities. And additionally, there is embedded support for students to navigate disability services on the campus, basic needs and other key supports. Next slide. So, so much of the, uh, what is at the core of this movement is envisioning our youth impacted by the juvenile justice system as scholars and as college material, both to demystify that for the larger community, but also for these students themselves. So we've had the great privilege to watch the power of this narrative change and the impact it's had on young people's lives, not just for them, but for their families, their communities, and future generations when a student who is in the justice system starts their college journey, and instead of returning to incarceration, they go forward to complete their higher education. Um, the power of education changed the trajectory of so many of these young people's lives. And a running theme is that uh, initially, many of them never imagined themselves as college students or were told that they're not college material. Uh, but once they got started, that light bulb went on and they never looked back. So as we reflect on the power of what's possible with education, it's important to look as well at the structural system barriers that are in place that need to be addressed in order to make it possible for our students to thrive. And with that, um, I'm happy to hand it over to my colleague, Jasmine, to share some more. Great, thank you, Katie. Next slide. Matt did a great job of talking about some of the overlapping populations um, with youth in the juvenile justice system. One thing I did want to especially highlight again was that overlap um, with foster youth populations. Um, and that's important when we're thinking about education, but also just in general, uh, you know, transition to adulthood, because there are a lot of resources out there um, that are meant to assist youth with experience with foster care or the child welfare system as they transition to adulthood. And it's really important to make sure that those resources are also accessible to young folks who have have that qualifying history with foster care or child welfare and who also happen to be in the juvenile justice system. So things like extended foster care, independent living programs, um, you know, uh, scholarship programs like the Chafee program or any state aid programs that are specifically targeted towards um, young folks who have um, prior uh, child welfare involvement. Um, in a lot of places, those, those resources are open already <clears throat> to young folks who have that juvenile justice experience, um, but, you know, because the systems aren't talking or because people don't think of youth in the juvenile justice system as maybe deserving of this kind of support that young folks in the foster care system are sometimes able to receive, um, there can just be some barriers to accessing resources that already exist. Next slide. So um, in addition to ch the challenges that may come from, you know, being a member of one of the overlapping populations um, that we just discussed, um, there are systemic issues within the juvenile justice system that can often push youth out of school. Um, so some examples of these would be a lack of educational stability 
uh, youth moving from placement to placement to placement and switching schools every time, a lack of appropriate educational services, particularly special education services for youth who are incarcerated in facilities, um, that, which is sometimes related to a lack of clarity about which entities are responsible for education. If you don't know who is in charge of providing that educational evaluation, for instance, uh, then there's probably not one not going to happen. <laughs> um, there is sometimes a lack of transition support, which can result in students dropping out of school when they're released from a facility rather than re-enrolling um, in a uh, you know, high school or a higher education program once they uh, exit the facility. Sometimes we see discrimination by school districts against youth with prior juvenile justice um, history where students want to re-enroll in school, but they're being told no. Um, and on top of all of that, there's misinformation about lack of high higher education or job opportunities for youth impacted by the juvenile justice system that can lead to people thinking, well, there's real no, there's no real point to educating these young people because they can't do anything anyways. It's important to remember that a lot of the issues we see around youth in the juvenile justice system and lack of educational attainment are due to law and policy choices that are deprioritize youth access to education. The good news is that together we can make different law and policy choices. Next slide. Just as a quick reminder, youth who are in the juvenile justice system do aspire to higher education and employment. It is not the case that youth in these systems do not want to work or do not want to go to school. Over two thirds of young people in the juvenile justice system aspire to go to college and beyond. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Youth with disabilities also can and do go to college. This is a pie chart that shows um, in general that about 19% uh, of young folks um, in colleges um, have disabilities and you can see listed there the different types of disabilities that are uh, tend to be reported, learning disabilities, um, ADHD, psychiatric disabilities, health and chronic uh, other disabilities and mobility disabilities. Um, <clears throat> Something to note here, because um, a lot of people are unaware of what disability support might look like in higher education. Students with disabilities can receive accommodations through their campus disability services center, which may also have other resources of students. Um, a full review of disability accommodations in higher education is far beyond the scope of this very brief presentation. Um, but the two big things to know are that one, the services are not coextensive with what's available in the K through 12 setting. And two, the rights holder is the student, not the parent. Um, and so what that means in practice is that a lot of times students, particularly those who have had really negative experiences with school or with special education, may be reluctant to reach out to disability services offices to find out what accommodations may be available to them, for, uh, such as assistive technology, a note taker, recordings of lectures, etc. Students may be more likely to access these resources if they have a direct connection to disability services at the college as part of their individualized education transition plan um, and or if they have a supportive adult or program that can help them navigate the system. And with regard to community college programs, I've spoken with a number of our community college programs here in California that work with students impacted by the juvenile justice system who also have disabilities. And one thing that they mentioned was that they were able to do a lot of work to destigmatize receiving disability services among their students. So rather than students being ashamed or reluctant to contact disability services, students would excitedly share their positive experiences they were having um, around, you know, a cool pen that they got um, that could help them with note taking or with um, reading comprehension. And everyone in the room would, would say, you know, oh, that's so cool. How did you get that? Rather than, you know, making fun of them um, the way that they might have been made fun of for receiving disability services when they were in school or in the juvenile hall. Next slide. We're going to do a really quick round of uh, myth busting some common myths related to higher education. Um, next slide. First myth post secondary education is only for people who have always been good at school. Next slide. Fact, community colleges, technical schools, and other open access institutions serve students with many different types of educational backgrounds who are in different stages of their lives, come with lots of different um, like life experiences, they might be parents, they might be um, you know, working and attending school at the same time, but these institutions, which are called open access institutions, serve lots of students with lots of different educational needs. Next slide. And when I talk about post-secondary education, just wanna be clear that I mean a four-year university degree. I could also mean two-year degrees that might prepare students for transfer to four-year or to enter directly into the workforce. And also certificate programs that might prepare students to enter directly into the workforce in as short as a few months. Next slide. 
Another myth is that people interested in trades shouldn't go to college. Next slide. Community colleges and technical schools are actually the nation's primary resource for career and technical education. Next slide. Now, in some states, there may be separate public systems for community colleges and technical schools, and in others, they are unified. So in California, we have one unified system with the community college system that um, encompasses a lot of the programs that in other states might be run through a technical school, um, a state technical school program. Um, so one thing that's just really important is in your own community understanding what are the programs that are available at the community colleges, what are available at the technical schools, how are they different, how are they the same. One thing that I will say in Tennessee, you know, we have two separate systems, community colleges and technical schools, but both community colleges and technical schools offer, <clears throat> offer degree programs that we might think of as technical programs or career and technical education. The types of coursework that you might see could include things like automotive technology, manufacturing tech, building and construction, various types of healthcare related things, um, truck driving, barbering, aesthetics, um, cosmetology, and sometimes you see things related to related to IT or office tech. Um, so lots of different ranges of things, and a lot of times these things differ um, depending, they're responsive, right, to the needs of the local workforce. Uh, <clears throat> next slide. One really big one, if you remember nothing else from my presentation, I hope you remember this, youth, um, youth in the juvenile justice system actually can get financial aid to go to college. So it's a myth that they can't. Next slide. Youth in the juvenile justice system are generally eligible for federal financial aid resources. Next slide. Um, so super quick rundown, we could do a whole hour on this. Um, basically, you, prior juvenile justice history does not impact eligibility for federal financial aid. There is no bar on access to federal financial aid based on prior convictions or adjudications for drug offenses. Um, youth in the juvenile justice, youth in juvenile justice facilities can access Pell Grants without any restrictions unless they have an adult criminal conviction. Um, but youth who are detained in juvenile justice facilities who also have a criminal conviction can still access Pell if they are enrolled in an approved prison education program. Um, note that generally a very small proportion of youth in juvenile facilities are there pursuant to an adult criminal conviction and the vast majority of young folks who are in most juvenile facilities would be able to access Pell Grants without any restrictions. I think Abir is going to share a link in the chat um, that has more detailed information about financial aid. I know this goes counter to a lot of what some of y'all have heard, um, but I promise that I'm not making it up. <laughs> um, youth with uh, juvenile justice experience are eligible for federal financial aid. Um, and with that, I'll pass it back to Katie. Thanks, Jasmine. Um, so as we said throughout, uh, our youth who have been impacted by the juvenile justice system can and do go to college. And so now we're going to share with you some specific examples of best practices based on model programming from the Project Change Program, which began a decade ago in the San Francisco Bay Area in San Mateo at the College of San Mateo. And as mentioned a little bit earlier, has been used recently as the model for replication through the California Rising Scholars Network to have community colleges across the state start similar programs in their county. And the Project Change Program is illustrated through the last decade, great success in college completion, as well as degree attainment and transfer to university, as well as certification and degrees in career and technical fields for our students. Next slide. So the state of California, um, with the 15 million annually to have community colleges across the state and have programs um, for juvenile justice impacted youth, is comprised of leaders and advocates who are supporting system impacted students at the colleges. And this funding uh, created a specific focus for the first time on juvenile justice youth. Before, there was more of an attention uh, to adults with prison and jail programming. But as we all know, youth need specific attention, and that's what this has established. Next slide. So some of the key guiding principles of the program model include post-secondary programming is available to all students, huge emphasis on all. Um, and we can talk in more detail about some of that, but one emphasis is the dual enrollment piece where it's reaching out to young people, um, you know, as young as 15, 16 to take these classes where they can take dual enrollment, earn high school credit and college credit at the same time. And that there's a variety of courses that are um, for all learning levels, um, which is, you know, another key component of the program model. 
Um, so we don't ask if students can succeed. We ask how stakeholders can create the structures and support to ensure that they do succeed. And that the goal of education is to connect students to communities, to help students avoid detention, and to facilitate reentry. Next slide. Katie, I'm hearing a time check. Um, so I think we might want to skip down to uh, slide 55, which is the diagram for the person who's running the slides of the program. Um, and just do those two, that and the takeaway slide, and then um, end. Great. Thanks so much for the time check. So as mentioned, um, and if people want to check out other program elements, just check out the slides um, and also happy to talk offline. But as mentioned, there are multiple entry points for students. So this could be while they're in detention or where they're in their home community as an intervention. Um, and when a student is in juvenile detention facility taking college programming, it's important that um, there's a, a space that's uniquely designed for college programming so that ac academic identity is fostered and having this space be in a classroom, um, having college logoed swag posters, notebooks, backpacks, all these things that we've seen programs do. Um, and when students are coming to the college campus, having that through reentry as an intervention um, before they've ever been in facilities is a good practice. And that there's also a physical space on the campus to welcome the students um, so that people can provide case management and that there's key connections uh, for students to be able to connect to disability services and other services that they're eligible for with wraparound support. Um, and so what we really want everyone to take away from with this is that, um, you know, students are coming in at all various points. We want to catch them um, wherever they may be to make this available to them and that this is a warm handoff structure. And so to la uh, lastly end our presentation in the next slide, um, just want to highlight some of the takeaways that we want to leave you all with that students with past and current involvement with the juvenile justice system can and do succeed in post-secondary education. Um, and that post-secondary education can serve students with different educational backgrounds and academic and career interests. So it can be wide sweeping. And students with past and current involvement in the justice system are eligible for federal financial aid as Jasmine brought up. And that effective post-secondary models for serving youth impacted by the juvenile justice system differ from those designed from adult prisons. And that on-campus programming is just as important as in-facility programming for ensuring our students' success. And lastly, connecting youth with juvenile justice involvement um, who have that with on-campus support can streamline access to disability services. And so much of this work now is also being led by those with lived experience, um, which is really exciting to see the generational shift happen as more young people go on and get their um, college education. Thanks, everyone. And I'll pass it back to Amir. Thank you so much, Katie and Jasmine here. We've shared their contact information. And again, we'll share this in follow-up. Next slide, please. But thank you so much for highlighting so many considerations on just an involved youth. And earlier this year, Katie and Jasmine provided a more detailed version of their work during a webinar with the Department of Justice. We just shared that chat in the link and we'll share that in follow-up communications as well. Now for our final state speaker, we have Superintendent Floyd Lyles. <clears throat> Excuse me. Floyd Lyles. Sorry, I'm going to introduce you really quick. Sorry, uh, sir. Uh, Floyd Lyles, the superintendent of the South Carolina Department of Juvenile Justice School District, and he's their deputy director of their Education and Workforce Development Division. His experience spans from the classroom to the boardroom, from direct instruction to direct leadership. And he joined the Department of Juvenile Justice in 2016 as assistant principal at their Birchwood School. Superintendent Lyles holds a master's in education specialist degrees from Converse College and a bachelor's degree from Benedict College. Superintendent Lyles, thank you for joining us. All right. Thank you so much for, for this opportunity. Um, I'm really, really excited to, to be here. I've learned a lot, took a lot of notes. Definitely have some new contacts that I'll be reaching out to. I do want to apologize to the panel. Um, I committed to, uh, to, to be a part of this team. And I had, you know, I lost a family member and, and I really just been off the map, but I committed to be here. So that's why I didn't get my slides in in time, but, but I'm so excited just to be here, just to share just a little about um, my time here at SCDJJ. You know, it's, it's really about our students, it's, it's about relationships, and it's about creating those partnerships that's gonna be life lasting. So I am excited to share with the team that 85 to 90% of our students are students uh, with special needs, 
But this year we had 111 graduates. And in seven and a half years, we have 900 graduates here at SCBJJ. So I'm super, super excited um, about the work that we put in to help close the gap for achievement for our students. And, you know, with the, those 900 graduates, this year we had over 45 students taking um, college classes. We had a young lady that just this week who was a student in special needs that were here for three and a half years. She started college at South Carolina State University today. So we're just excited to be able to share our story. And so some of the things that, that we're doing here at SCDJJ, we're, we're creating, um, like we, we have a data team system, so we can touch every single student every day. And, and what that means with our data team, what our data team system, we have um, our principals meeting with their team like every other week. So we can make sure that we're touching students that we're, we know exactly what they need. You know, a number of our students come in uh, with, you know, they're 17, 18 years old with one or two high school credits. And so we, we look at what's best for that student. We make sure we contact all the families involved and, and we weigh out the option whether the students will get a high school diploma or whether they'll get their GED. But with our success rate, we, had, we created a really, really good problem. We had a lot of graduates on campus. And so we have four different colleges that we partner with, um, Allen University, South Carolina State University, Voorhees, and Mid Midlands Technical College here in Columbia. So we are expanding. We're looking for more opportunities for students to take the next step and to move forward to, to have a better outcome. I, I also wanna share that this year we had over, so as we're, we're, we're tracking students while they're with us. And so the last 100 days from 100 to 60 to 90 to the time the students are released, we had uh, 700, 715 students that completed like career assessments. Over 250 students, um, we made sure they would have jobs as they were entering back into the community, along with uh, a number of our students are leaving us going back to college. So we have three sophomores um, in college, and we have one junior that's left us that started the college program and just created, you know, a whole new trajectory for their lives and, and, and their families. I heard so many awesome, awesome stories and opportunities, uh, made notes of like how we can close the gap with some of the things that I heard today. But, but it's important for us to create those partnerships and, and create systems that all students can be successful. I heard um, some of my colleagues earlier talk about ways to, you know, make sure like, like it's this myth that, well, well, you've been in trouble your whole life, so you'll never be successful. Well, you know, one of our students left us with 24 college credits um, here from SCDJJ. So it's definitely possible. And, and we have a theme here where we say, you know, success is our only option. We, we really, really um, believe that. And it's about relationships. So I've been fortunate in my career to have the opportunity to serve as, you know, elementary principal, a middle school, high school principal, and then a principal here at SCDJJ and now superintendent. And the one thing I want to really, really overemphasize is really about relationships. You know, I didn't do anything different when I was a principal in elementary school than being the principal here at SCDJJ. Because when students know you care about them and you have a sincere heart of building a relationship and getting to know them first, I mean, it's unbelievable what happened. And, you know, seven and a half years ago, if you had to say, Mr. Lyles, in, in seven and a half years, you would have 900 graduates here at SCDJJ. I, you know, that would have been, I have to thought like, no way that's possible. But if, if it was not for COVID-19, we would have a thousand graduates. There's no, no question about that at all. And, and, you know, and so, you know, what I want to definitely share with the team and just say, you know, it's, it's about systems. It's about really, really getting to know students and, and find out more about their stories. And we just, you know, excited about what we do. And I just want to say thank you to this team for this opportunity. You know, I had a lot going on personally, but I wanted to be a part of this. And this has been really a special day for me as well. So thank you so much um, for joining.
Thank you so much, Superintendent Lyles, for your work and highlighting the great work you've been doing in South Carolina. And thank you for joining us in light of that, that, fam, uh, that what you said happened. We appreciate you taking the time for us. Thank you so much. That, include, that concludes the presentation portion of today's webinar. Uh, we're going to just take one to two questions since we're uh, a little bit over on time. So I'm just going to ask one or two questions uh, to, to, our, to our guest speakers. Thank you again for joining us for this. Um, uh, I believe one, I, I believe this was asked, um, this was asked for uh, uh, Dr. Harmon, or it may have been for Katie and Jasmine, apologies where I missed the timing. But the question was, are post-secondary education opportunities being provided, uh, being discussed primarily for county and local justice involved youth? And are these the same opportunities for those youth in secure facilities? That's one question we had, if any of our speakers want to address that. Uh, yeah, just briefly what I said in the chat. Um, California, we are in, in the process of becoming an all local system. So our uh, state youth prison just closed or isn't about to close. Um, but prior to that, um, we had passed legislation um, indicating that we wanted the same level of access for of post-secondary education programs in that state youth prison system in addition um, to local facilities. Abir, I think you're on mute. Thank you so much. Uh, I believe there was one question also for Dr. Harmon, and um, I believe they were asking with the programming you're doing at OYA, is there a screening that, that's being done for a history of traumatic brain injury specifically for youth entering OYA programming? So we do screen it, the psychologists and medical providers just as part of our regular course of uh, practice will ask about a history of head injuries or things that would result in head injuries depending on what we have as an answer back from the youth or what is contained in records, we have the ability to ask follow-up questions to see if there might be impacts from that and then uh, assess and then assess based off of that or, or hold and do a recommendation for more thorough assessment up to and including full neuropsychological assessment. So yes, but not in any sort of like specific tool at the time of intake, it's much more just our clinical practice. Thank you so much, Dr. Hartman, and that will be the time for questions. Thank you to our audience for those great questions. Thank you to our speakers for answering those. Um, as you know, we've shared their uh, contact information, and again, we'll share that in follow-up communication as well to make sure if anyone has any additional questions, uh, we'll share. Uh, you can contact them directly. Uh, next slide, please. Now to close us out, it is my honor to introduce Assistant Secretary of Labor, Taryn Williams. Taryn Williams served as the Assist Assistant Secretary of Labor for Disability Employment Policy. She leads the USDOL's Office of Disability Employment Policy, as I mentioned before, ODEP for short. Uh, previously, she served as Managing Director of the Poverty to Prosperity Program at the Center for American Progress, as Chief of Staff for ODEP, Associate Director of Public Engagement for the White House, and a Policy Advisor for the U.S. Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. She earned a bachelor's degree from Brown University in Public Policy and her master's in Education from Harvard University. Assistant Secretary Williams, thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thanks, Sabir. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon, or I suppose for some people it might still be morning. I want to start by saying thank you to the KP staff, uh, to Dr. Brian Hartman, to Katie Bliss and Jasmine Miller, to Floyd Miles for the presentation today. Um, like the superintendent, I've learned a lot and really appreciated not only hearing from our different presenters, but also following along in the chat uh, as you all ask great questions. Um, it was great to truly hear from all of you and to learn more about how you all are supporting effective transition services and strategies to improve long-term opportunities for justice-involved youth. And as you heard, uh, I am uh, Assistant Secretary Williams, and I do have the privilege of serving as the head of the Office of Disability Employment Policy. And today's webinar is an important one for us. It's part of our work to expand opportunities for diverse uh, career pathways that are inclusive of underserved populations. It's 
critical that we do this work because youth and young adults uh, ages 14 to 24 with a documented disability are less likely than their non-justice involved peers to participate in higher education, to access workforce services, or to maintain long-term employment in the absence of post-secondary training and economic supports. And we know that collaboration is critical to the work that all of us do. And it's particularly important to ODEP's work because systems coordination and interagency collaboration are critical activities to ensuring that youth and young adults with disabilities have the best chance of accessing the full array of programs and services to reach their desired employment outcomes. That is especially true of justice-involved youth. Meeting the needs of youth requires strategic partnerships between traditional and non-traditional workforce stakeholders and collaborative partnerships to develop workforce opportunities for youth and young adults, including those exiting the juvenile justice system, are critical to realizing our goals for greater equity and equal opportunity. I'm really excited to note that ODEP recently announced funding for collaborations to improve state youth workforce systems through the equity transition model. We sometimes call it ETM. The ETM demonstration grants will support youth workforce systems to address the needs of youth from underserved communities. Grantees will develop scalable strategies to enable low income youth with disabilities, including youth experiencing homelessness, leaving foster care on SSI or involved in the justice system to be more likely to transition to employment successfully. Uh, I believe there's a slide here that has a link for uh, the recently released equitable transition model funding opportunity announcement. And so we'll make sure that that is made available to all of our participants. And I know we're just at time, so I just want to, again, say thank you to our presenters, as well as to all of you, our participants. We look forward to connecting in the future as we work to address the workforce needs of youth from underserved communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Assistant Secretary Williams, for closing us out and wonder uh, and highlighting the wonderful work that you and the Department of Labor are leading uh, around this topic. Uh, and thank you again. Uh, next slide, please. On this slide, you'll find some of the policy briefs Cape Youth has uh, released. You know, we shared our ones that were just involved youth earlier. These are on related topics from trauma informed care, mental health, intersectionality, apprenticeship, and more. Again, we'll share these slides, which include these links. Uh, we've also shared it in the in the, um, in the the chat just now. We'll link to our policy briefs page and we'll share a recording of today's webinar and the resources we'll link to those that our speakers mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. And listed here are our social media tags where you can feel free to, uh, to, to follow us on uh, Facebook and X and also Matt and mine contact information if you have any questions for Cape Youth. I want to thank our fantastic speakers again for your wonderful remarks, as well as our audience members for participating. We had a lot of great notes in the chat. I've been noting a lot of the great things, not just that our speakers shared, but that was shared. Um, uh, that's that was shared by people in the chat as well from our audience. Thank you so much for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.